Well, good morning. If you haven't heard that already three times before, and I hope you have, I hope that our, our greeters and our ushers are doing such a wonderful job that by the time you get here, you've been welcomed and greeted and, and all of those things. But I just want to add to that as your pastor that, that I'm glad that you're here. One, because preaching to an empty room is kind of a downer. But uh, two, because, because we get this community thing. If you haven't gotten to me by now that, that I'm kind of a community guy, and uh, that, that's why we exist as a church, is so that no one will have to do life alone. No one has to do life alone. And nowhere do we see that uh, more prevalently than, than in our, our sermon series that we're on right now. But, but before we get to that, there's a couple of things that I'm excited about that I want to get into your hearts and minds and hands. And the first one is this. Next weekend is July 4th weekend. And uh, so I thank you for being here this weekend and next weekend. But next weekend, I'm going to ask a little favor from this group. Uh, we're going to have one service next week, and we're going to do it at 9 o'clock because I know that people have uh, exciting things going on both Saturday and, and on, or Sunday and Monday uh, with the July 4th weekend. So if you, could, if you could just do me one favor and come at 9 o'clock instead of 10.30 next week, uh, I, I will reward you. Uh, we'll reward you with, with one getting together, but then on the next week after that, which is July 10th, can you believe it? July's half over already and we haven't even started it. But July 10th in just two weeks, we're going to meet together in the park, in the park out west by the, by the pool, the, you know, the, the brand new pool that they just opened up, or at least new this season. So, uh, um, But we're going to meet at that park, but we're going to give you guys the glory to know that we're going to meet at 1030 on July 10th. And we're going to make the nine o'clockers, you know, kind of sleep in a little bit and know how that feels too. So uh, nine o'clock next week, 1030 the following week out at the park. And we're going to have inflatables for the kids. We're going to have uh, cotton candy, snow cones, uh, hot dogs, uh, food and stuff like that right after the service. We're going to have games. So it's going to be one of those days where we can come, we can worship together outside in the park and then hang around and have lunch and, and just, get to, just get to be a part of the community for a few hours. We're expecting a nice day on that day and we're hoping that God will bless us with that. But along with that, you were given this card in your bulletins. And this card is one yes, a reminder for you, but it's also a reminder to give it to someone that doesn't go to church and that they would maybe find living hope as their home. But what better place to, to worship together in an unthreatening environment is just to hang out at the park. And uh, you can even bribe them with food. I know that has always worked for me. So uh, bribe them with a little food if you have to, but bring your friends to that and let's worship together in the park. Well, as I said, we're, we're in our series called Hang On, and if you haven't been here before, uh, the Hang On series is based around Jesus' own words. When people asked him, of all of the law, what's, what's the most important? And Jesus' response was, was great in that it was, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. So, so to simplify that, it's just love God, love everybody else. Kind of covers it all. Kind of makes it simple for me. You know, I, I'm, I need simple a lot of times. Uh, don't verify that by asking my wife because she'll tell you how simple it needs to be sometimes. But, but uh, how simple does it make? And then Jesus' very next statement is this. All of the law, all of the prophets hang on these two commands. That's where hang on came from. And it's, it's just that simple that if we're worried if, if we're doing the right thing or if we're good enough or, or what the prophets had to tell us in the, in the Old Testament or even the prophet of, of revelation of yet to come, how am I going to sort all this out? There's so much there and I just don't know. Just simplify it down. That everything we know hangs on love God, love everybody else. Can we do that? Because everything is based on that. Everything that we know, the, the big 10, Exodus 20, the 10 commandments, hangs on loving God and loving everybody else. All that Paul and, and the New Testament writers have, have to tell us on how to be good people and, and what to do as Christ followers hangs on the words of love God and love everybody else. It's just that simple. And we make it so hard. I'm, I'm just as guilty. I, I make life so much harder for myself sometimes because, because I want to make sure that I do everything right. And i got to make sure that I live up to everybody's expectations. 
You feel that way too? I know that you do. Well, today I want you to follow along in your note-taking guide or pop-up version uh, if you haven't heard that before. But on version, if you go into the events tab, uh, you're going to find us there. And you're going to find the bulletin there and the announcements there, and you can take notes and all of that. But remember to save your version, and uh, otherwise it'll go away tomorrow. But as we get into that, think back, if you would, Just a few years ago, maybe five years ago, back to March 11th, 2011. Do you know where you were at March 11th, 2011? Excuse me, let me grab my my moisture here. But you may not know it as a day that's going to live in infamy. But the people of Japan will. And the people of Japan's main island, which off uh, off the island some, oh... Oh, 90, uh, I forget now what it was, 20, 30 miles off the coast of Japan, 18 miles below the ocean floor, there was a 9.0 earthquake that happened on that day. And if you remember that, this 9.0 earthquake is, is big enough. But then check this out. There, it's, it, it took a piece of the crust of the earth. We just got through talking about fault lines. So we've been talking about shifts and things that happen. But it took a piece of the crust that was 190 miles long. Okay, what is that, here to Murdo? And 95 miles wide, what is that, here to Yankton or so? That piece of land in one instant shifted to the east-southeast 165 feet. And it shot up into the ocean floor 33 feet in one massive push. 190 miles wide by 95 miles deep. And it pushes up on the ocean floor 33 feet. And it created a tsunami that took off from there. A tsunami that hit Japan at 33 feet high. Some reports say that this tsunami washed inland up to six miles. The devastation that occurred that you can see with the pictures here. Now it was bad enough as it washed in. And it just destroyed everything in its wake. If there, there's, you can find just about anything you want on the internet, but as you watch some of the videos that are on there, and you see these people just standing there like, huh, there's a wave. Because it's, it's not something that you expect every day, is it? There's a wave. But that would be some of those people's final words in all of their life. Huh, there's a wave. And it washes in, and and worse yet is all the people that got caught into it as it washed in, when it washed back out to sea, there were thousands of people that got washed out miles to sea, never to be heard from again. Some of their bodies were found. But this wave, not just destroying pieces of Japan, this wave raced across the ocean at some 500 miles an hour. I can't even understand that. A wave that's moving across the ocean as fast as a commercial jetliner does. And when it hits, it hits other areas as well. It's said to have uh, generated 11 to 12 foot waves that hit Kauai and Hawaii and on the Hawaiian islands. Five foot waves along the Aleutian Islands. Several hours later, nine hours later, uh, nine foot waves struck the coasts of California and Oregon in North America. And finally, some 18 hours after this event happened, uh, still a one-foot tsunami wave hit the ice shelf in Antarctica, causing causing part of the ice shelf in Antarctica to, to calve off and fall into the sea. Thousands of miles away, at hundreds of miles an hour, this one event that happened naturally shakes up the lives of just about everybody around the world. That's amazing to think about, the, the, the strength and, the, and the, the impact that one event can have on our lives. Now you may be saying, well, Pastor Brian, what's that got to do with us? Well, uh, we're going to see here just a moment because we're going to be in the prophet Joel today. Joel is a short minor prophet. It, it, the minor prophets, if you remember, are minor because they're the shorter books, the shorter prophet books, not because they're less important. That uh, Well, we got the really important ones and then here's all the, that's not what it is. It's, it's the short ones. So short book means short service, short message, right? <laughs> that was a nervous laugh. I don't know what you're worried about. But the aftermath of this one tsunami that some 18 to 20,000 people lost their lives on that day or in the days to come. All in an instant. All because of a disaster. Now most likely if you remember that, you may not uh, remember this. We did have someone in the first service that remembered a little bit of this. But but we refer it back to the dirty 30s. 
And, and the, the natural disaster that happened in the, in the United States, especially, but in North America, due to that drought into that season. Do we have anybody here that was, that was back then? Anybody? Anybody? No? Okay. Just wanted to make sure. Oh, sorry. I probably owe you a dinner now for that one. But uh, even Randy wasn't here for that. So, uh, but, but remember back to the dirty 30s. You got the dirty 30s with, with not just the drought, but anything that came out of the ground. And due to a drought came what? Came the grasshoppers and the locusts. That anything that did come out of the ground was gone, was shorn down to the, to the roots and was destroyed. The farmers were trying to get their crops in and trying to do that and trying to make a living, but it didn't happen that year. It didn't happen the year after that. And it didn't happen the year after that. And it's severe famine, almost, you'd, if we were writing it in the Bible, that it was a famine, that it was, it was a natural disaster, that people were hungry, people were of want. And that's where I want to get today. Let's start off with our note-taking guide with this, that sometimes life gives you the unexpected. Sometimes life gives you the unexpected. In the story of Joel that we're going to read this morning, that uh, let's start off right in the first chapter of Joel in verse 2. It says this, God is speaking to Joel. He says, hear this, you leaders of the people. Listen, all who live in the land, in all your history, has anything like this ever happened before? Tell your children about it in the years to come and let your children tell their children. Pass the story down from generation to generation. You see, after the cutting locusts finished eating the crops, the swarming locusts took what was left. After them came the hopping locusts and then the stripping locusts too. Wake up, you drunkards, and weep. Wail, all you wine drinkers. All the grapes are ruined and all your sweet wine is gone. Their entire industry had taken a hit. A vast army of locusts has invaded my land, a terrible army too, too numerous to count. Its teeth are like that of lion's teeth, its large fangs like those of a lioness. It has destroyed my grapevines and ruined my fig trees, stripping their bark and destroying it, leaving the branches white and bare. Weep like a bride dressed in black, mourning the death of her husband. For there is no grain or wine to offer at the temple of the Lord. So the priests are in mourning. The ministers of the Lord are weeping. The fields are ruined. The land is stripped bare. The grain is destroyed. The grapes have shriveled and all the olive oil is gone. Let that sink in as to what's just happened. The people are devastated. This isn't just a farm that's decimated. This is an entire region and when an entire region of something happens, it doesn't just affect those people, but the outcroppings of that devastation are felt miles and miles and miles away. Everyone here, as you can see, as Joel was being told, everyone's going to suffer at some point. Everyone's going to suffer in some way, whether it happens directly to you or you're just a result of what that is. Joel hears from God, and what he hears does not start out in a positive word of encouragement. In fact, it's quite the opposite. We, we like those passages in the, in the Bible where, where God gives us an encouraging word, a, a hope for tomorrow and, and strength for today. And then we get to Joel. These poor prophets, if you've read any of the minor prophets or the major prophets, and if you read, those guys had a tough job, man. Hey, I want you to tell my people, great, I'm all for that. Let me, let me be your voice, God. That sounds pretty exciting, doesn't it? All right, tell them this. Uh, uh, really? <laughs> are you sure? Right, Vi? Or, or, uh, hey, how about something a little more happy, happy, joy, joy? But Joel gets to told this, tell my people this. Tell my people that this is what's coming. And there's a reason for it. There's a reason that God starts off this way. And, and Joel tells his people, get ready. This is what God is telling us for a disaster like you have never seen is coming before. Now, if the people of Japan or, or in the dirty 30s, the people of Oklahoma and Texas, if they had been warned before what was going to happen, what could they have done? Would that have made a difference? Maybe it would. Maybe it wouldn't have. Your farm is still there. You don't get to move all of that ground to somewhere that's safe. You don't get to put up giant nets over all your acres. But you're going to have to be ready for it. So what are you going to think? What are you going to do when life happens to you? 
There was, uh, well, if you know Amazon, Amazon is the maker of the Kindle reader. And uh, some of you may have a Kindle reader. We gave away a Kindle in our Kindle marriage class uh, this last spring, and we're going to do it again this fall. But, but Kindle's 25 most highlighted passages. It's very interesting. This happened a few years ago, but, but they put out a list because they can tell when, when you're on your Kindle reader and you highlight something, they, you know, everybody can tell what you've highlighted. And, and th- so they had the list of the top 25, and 19 of the top 25 passages came from Suzanne Collins' trilogy, The Hunger Games. Okay, so it was wildly read and wildly highlighted. And, and this report from the New Republic, it notes that some of the things that, that were highlighted and, and some of the things that I've noted could have probably come out of the Bible, could have come out of Proverbs, so to speak, and, and see if you don't agree. The first one, the top highlighted passage throughout all of the Kindles was this, and it was from The Hunger Games. Because sometimes things happen to people and they're not equipped to deal with them. Doesn't that sound like something that could have come out of Scripture? That, that we are a people that sometimes we are not equipped to handle what is happening to us. So what do we do? The number four highlighted passage was this. It takes ten times as long to put yourself back together as it does to fall apart. True? That's hard. We're a people that, that can prove that because when we were growing up and they talked about, what do you, watch what you say. Yeah, the old story of sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. No greater lie was ever told to a child. <laughs> words do hurt. In fact, we, we, we have science to back it up that if somebody says something negative, do you remember how many positive things have to be said to them to forget about that? Seven. That's right. Seven positive comments to overtake one negative comment. I wonder if that's why maybe God told us to watch what comes out of our mouths. Because we can either do it for good or we can do it for harm. Number 12 highlighted passage was this. We're fickle, stupid beings with poor memories and a great gift for self-destruction. I'm not sure that one is quite in biblical text. But it's no less true. We are a fickle group. And with poor memories and a great gift for self-destruction. Left to our own abilities, to our own decision-making, we always tend to seem to float to to making bad choices. We always tend to to teeter or to to make a wrong choice. We're good at that as a people, aren't we? And I don't understand it. But I do want to ask you this question, this one question. Where do you turn when disaster strikes? Where do you turn when disaster strikes? What are you going to do, farmers, when tomorrow that hailstorm of all hailstorms comes through and wipes you out? What are you going to do, bankers, when the European Union cracks and fractures and the stock market drops over 600 points in a day? What are you going to do when that loved one sitting right next to you isn't sitting there tomorrow? What are you going to do? That's a sobering reminder that we can take from the scripture of Joel. Because when a natural disaster strikes, it's as if Joel, through God, by God, is asking, what are you going to do? How how are you going to to react to that? How are you going to act to that? Lifeway, a few years ago, did some research on that, and they they did an opinion poll on that, and they asked a bunch of questions, and here's their results. That when a natural disaster strikes, or, or uh, let me read the question, how do you feel about God when suffering occurs that seems unfair? Okay, when, when, when something happens to us that we don't deem as fair, what is your, rec- uh, well, how do you feel about God when suffering occurs that seems unfair? Here's how people responded. 33% of them said, I trust God more. There, I think there are people that understand it and they get it. 25% said, I'm confused about God. I understand that, don't you? I get that. 16%, I don't think about God in those circumstances. Oh, that one hurt my heart. Because if you don't think about God in those circumstances, then what are you thinking about? Where are you putting your trust? 11% said, I wonder if God cares. That one hurts too. I wonder if God cares because that's why I'm glad that you're here at Living Hope because I want to tell you as a messenger from God that God does love you, that God does care, that God cannot love you any more than he does, even though it may not seem like it in our frailty of thinking. But God loves you. God has a plan for each and every one of you. 
and he wants you to follow after him. But 11% wonder if God even cares. 8% said, I'm angry or resentful at God when that happens. I understand that. We're, we're, we're human. We have emotions. God has let us have emotions. I get that. 7%, I doubt God exists. Oh, that's another harsh one. If God doesn't exist, then, then who's control of this big blue ball that we live on? Who's in control of when, when something happens? Who's in control when, when somebody crosses that double yellow line and runs head on into somebody that we love? If, if there is no God, if there is no purpose, if there is no nothing after this, then you're right, you're going to lose hope. But I am here to tell you today that there is a hope. That there is something beyond the tragedy of this life. There is something beyond the natural disasters that can crop up into our lives. There is something. Nearly 60% of those survey respondents said at the very least, their interest in God increases. I'm glad for that. I hope that when you hit a rough patch in your life, or when something happens to you, that your interest in God at least increases so that you can hear from him, so that you can weep before him, so that you can fall on your face before God and turn. Turn back to God. We've talked about that last week, that, that sometimes we're living a life that, that needs to be readjusted to this. And I think Joel is telling us that there's a whole, a whole segment of the region of the world that needed to understand who God is and where he is. Point number two is this. Now is the time to turn to Jesus. Now is that time to turn to Jesus. We'll jump ahead to Joel chapter 2 this time in verse 12 where it says, That is why the Lord says, Turn to me now. While there is time, give me your hearts. Come with fasting, weeping, and mourning. Don't tear your clothing in grief, but tear your hearts instead. What does he mean by that? This is a culture that when they were in mourning, they would tear their clothes and, and pour ashes all over their body so that people knew they were in mourning. Joel is telling them from God that don't tear your clothes, but instead tear your heart. Turn your heart, turn your focus, turn what's important to you back to me. One of the, the older words that maybe you heard growing up was the word repent. Repent. He's telling the nation, repent. Bad things are afoot. You can see that. Now is the time for you to wake up. Now is the time for you to pay attention. Now is the time for you to repent and turn back to God, for you can control nothing. There are times in our lives when nothing seems to make sense. There's times in our lives where, where our lives seem to be turned upside down and you know what, as, as a people, we get into a pretty good habit of, of trying to numb ourselves from the pain. I don't want any pain in my life. Somebody, somebody told you a, a, a lie. Somebody told you a lie that, that, one, if you follow Christ, your life is always going to be easy. Some people actually say that, and that hurts my heart. God never said your life was going to be easy if you follow him. But he did tell you that you can have joy all the time. Even in the good times, even in the bad times, you can have joy in your life. But you have to do something. You have to get out of where you're at. You have to stop thinking that whatever happens today is, is the only thing that's going to happen in your life. And you have to put your focus on something beyond today and to have a hope for tomorrow. And only that hope comes through Jesus Christ. God is wanting a nation to turn back to him. Boy, couldn't that get political quick in a hurry. God is wanting our nation to turn back to Him. It does not matter who gets elected president. God is still God, and we are a people of sin that need to turn and repent to Him. If we don't know what to do, turn to God today. And if you don't do it today, if you've got that inside of you is saying that I should turn back to God today, do it today. Let me encourage you, do it now. Because if you don't, just like me, you're going to talk yourself out of it. You, you, you'll talk yourself out of it. That's why it's impulse buying is, is such a retailer's dream, is they want you to impulse buy because they know if it's not a good idea that if you walk away from it for a moment, you can talk yourself back out of it again. You can get reasonable with it again. Well, God is kind of the opposite way of saying the reasonable thing that you can do is follow after me. The reasonable thing you can do is repent from your sin. Do it now because otherwise you're going to talk yourself out of it. Otherwise, you're going to you walk away and think that maybe there's a, a better way. Think that maybe there's a less painful way to go about this life. 
I want you to have joy. Just like Jesus told us in John 10, 10, I have come that you may have life and that you may have life to the full. That doesn't mean he's going to have a good life or an easy life. That means you're going to have life to the full. Do you want life to the full? Do you want life that is always up with a, with a hope and a future to come and a life that's everlasting with God? That is life to the full. Let's go back to Joel chapter 2 and verse 13 and 14. It says, Return to the Lord your God, for he is merciful and compassionate, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. He is eager to relent and not to punish. Who knows? Perhaps he will give you a reprieve, sending you a blessing instead of a curse. Perhaps you will be able to offer grain and wine to the Lord your God as before. Turn to God and perhaps... Maybe if you ask, maybe he will relent. If you ask and turn your heart back to him, maybe he will give you a blessing instead of what you have to go through. To make this point, I want to tell you about a farmer. We have a few of those around here, and I'm glad for it. But there was a farmer that was growing his crops and, and the crops were coming out of the, out of the ground like they were supposed to on any great day. And, and like many of you do, I know my father and my in-laws are farmers and, and every once in a while they'll get, they'll get, where are they at? Well, they're out in the field just walking around. Isn't that a good feeling sometimes to do it? To just to see what God is doing. And the crops were coming out of the ground and it was going to be a good year. Everything was coming along perfectly and, and life was good. When all of a sudden this farmer hears a noise like a rushing wind coming from behind him. And his first thought was, was maybe like we have here where, oh, there's going to be a thunderstorm. It's that afternoon thunderstorm thing that's going to happen and the wind's about to kick up. And as he turns around and as he looks, not a storm cloud was to be found in the sky. But instead there were swarms and swarms of locusts and grasshoppers that were coming to descend upon his fields. The sun was blotted out. The day turned into night as the grasshoppers and locusts descended throughout the region and throughout the fields to have their way with the crops or anything that was coming out of the ground. This farmer, you can imagine what his heart did. His heart sank in his chest. And, and as he watched this and as he watched it happen and, and as he gets back to the house and, and time goes on and he's, what am I going to do now? What, you know, I got one fly swatter. What's that going to do? Nothing. In his desperation, he thought, I don't, I, I got nothing. But he had chickens. He had, he had a, several coops of chickens, and he thought, chickens like grasshoppers. I, I know this doesn't make any sense, but, but I've got a few, maybe they can do something. And so he lets all of the chickens out into his fields. And chickens do like grasshoppers. And they ate, and they ate, and they ate, and they ate their fill, and they had good protein, and, and his crops were destroyed. And he was thinking, why, why did God allow this to happen to me? What, what am I going to do? I don't have a crop anymore. I don't have a way to pay my bills. I don't have anything to put in the bank for my kids. I don't have anything to... How am I going to buy food for the next year? My crop is being ruined right in front of my eyes, even with the chickens and whatever that they can eat. But as the days went on, something interesting started to happen. He started to notice that day after day, with all of the good protein that the chickens were getting, that they were laying eggs. And they were laying lots of eggs and they were, they were taking care of these eggs and chicks were being hatched and, and before he knew it, the fields were full of chickens. Now, they didn't save his crops. His crops were still destroyed. But this farmer now had more chickens than he knew what to do with. And he built bigger coops, recovered them back from all of their nourishment that they had and went into chicken farming. That God had changed the purpose of what his income was going to be and now he raises and sells chickens instead of crops. Sometimes God wants to get our attention just like that. Sometimes what we think is a good idea. How many, how many of us have ever done that? I'm, I laugh because I've done it. Hey God, I've got a really good idea. How many of you are with me on that one? God, I've got, you know, from, from my vantage point, and of course, I can see everything, i got a really good idea. Let's do this. And I think that it's just like a two-year-old that comes to me with a cookie jar and says, i got a good idea. <laughs> don't we chuckle? Don't we, don't we kind of chuckle at that? Oh, that's cute. I wonder if God does that. Oh, <laughs> that's cute. I'll, I think he does. I, I'll take that under advisement. But I wonder if sometimes in our lives, we get, to, we get such a path in our lives, and the older we get, the worse it gets. 
because we get entrenched, we get ingrained, we get, we've worked hard because we are Midwesterners and we can work hard and we can make it happen. And God, just like the farmer, says, hey, what about this direction for your life? I do believe without the shadow of a doubt that God has created each and every one of us in this room with a purpose in mind. And that all we have to do is love God, love everybody else, and He will refine our hearts and our visions to see why He created us. We are all different, but we are all created with a purpose. And the purpose starts with love God, love everybody else, and then it goes in its merry way therefrom. Do we pay attention? God is telling Joel to get the nation one. You need to repent and you need God now. You need to pay attention to God now while there's still time to do it. Because when it gets sloppy out, when the day is darkest, when the, when the pressure is on, that's not the time we start thinking about options or at least good options. That's the time where we start to fight or flee or do whatever we do. So turn to God and turn to Him now. Joel paid attention to what God was telling him to tell his people. To finish out a little further into Joel chapter 2, 15, it says this, Blow the ram's horn in Jerusalem. Announce a time of fasting. Call people together for a solemn meeting. Gather all the people, the elders, the children, and even the babies. Call the bridegroom from his quarters and the bride from her private room. You know it's important when you can get a bride and a groom from their honeymoon. Let the priests who minister in the Lord's presence stand and weep between the entry room to the temple and to the altar. Let them pray. Spare your people, Lord. Don't let your special passion become an object of mockery. Or excuse me, your special possession become an object of mockery. Don't let them become a joke for unbelieving foreigners who say, has the God of Israel left them? Return to God. Fall on your knees. Take a time to pray before Him, to give Him everything that you're thinking. Don't think that if you don't tell Him, He won't know. But He loves to hear it when we tell Him all of our good things and all of our struggles and our sorrows. Return to God. Get on your knees. Take a time of weeping. Take a time of prayer. Take a time of fasting. Number three is this. God doesn't leave Joel and the Israelites there. It's not just all gloom and doom and, hey, bad stuff's going to happen. You better turn around, although that make a good story all by itself. But there is a hope for tomorrow. By the time Joel gets done, he also gets to tell the people of Israel, there is a hope for tomorrow. There's something good upon the horizon. Pay attention to me. We see this in Joel all the way from the end of chapter 2 through chapter 3. Let's pick up our reading in Joel 3, 14 now. There is a day of the Lord that will arrive soon, that will soon arrive. The sun and the moon will grow dark and the stars will no longer shine. The Lord's voice will roar from Zion and the thunder from Jerusalem and the heavens and the earth will shake. But the Lord will be our refuge for his people, a strong fortress for his people of Israel, blessings for God's people. Then you will know that I, the Lord your God, live in Zion, my holy mountain. Jerusalem will be holy forever and foreign armies will never conquer her again. What he's talking about here is, is actually, I think, pushes towards the book of Revelation of things yet to come for even us. But God is going to be there and God is going to conquer the armies. In that day, the mountains will dip with, drip with sweet wine and the hills will flow with milk. Water will fill the stream beds of Judah like a fountain and it will burst forth from the Lord's temple, watering the arid valley of Acacias. But Egypt will become a wasteland and Edom will become a wilderness because they attacked the people of Judah and killed innocent people in their land. But Judah will be filled with people forever. And Jerusalem will endure through all generations. You don't have to wonder if Israel's going to survive this. They will because the word of God says that they will. I will pardon my people's crimes, which I have not yet pardoned. And I, the Lord, will make my home in Jerusalem with my people. That, ladies and gentlemen, is something you can take to the bank. That is a hope for tomorrow that each and every one of us can have. That even if we feel that life kind of sucks right now, there is a hope for tomorrow because God is already there. We need to be God's people. We need to repent and turn to God. We also see this in the Joel's kind of words and, and format takes place in the New Testament. 
In Galatians chapter 3, Paul talks to the people of Galatia. He says, He redeemed us in order that the blessings given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Another piece of hope that is for all of us, that just because we're not Jews, that's okay, because, because they talk about the Gentiles. And Paul spent all of his time saying, yep, the Jews are the promised people, but God wants all the people of the earth, you and I, the Gentiles of the world, and we have a promise that we can stand on. And if you turn your heart to God, if you repent from your sins, if you tell God, I'm sorry for making these mistakes and living life on my own, I want to turn and live a life for you. If you are willing to say that, that's all that it takes to turn to him to be saved. And he has promised you a helper. He has promised you the Holy Spirit to help guide you, to help internally direct you so that you can fall on your knees before him and have an advocate to the Father so that you can take a time of fasting and a time of reconciliation to turn your face to God. That is what Joel has for us today. Isn't that an encouraging word? Isn't that an encouraging word that there's, there's more to life than just paying bills and hoping the crop comes in or hoping I don't lose my job or hoping I'm good enough to be able to do this or hoping whatever that may be. There's more to life than that. This life that we live now is about this big and eternity goes on forever. Live that life with God in your, mar- in your mind and your heart. Father God, thank you. Thank you from this word from Joel. May it it permeate permeate our hearts and our minds today that we, even in whatever we're facing, can turn our face to you, God. That we can have an encouragement that there is a life beyond just today. That there is a hope for tomorrow that starts today. Father, if there are those that hear my voice that need that encouragement today to turn to you, to turn around and repent their sins to you, Father. Help them to do that today. If that is you, then just simply say to God, God, I'm sorry that I have sinned, that I've gone against your law and your way of life. Forgive me. If you say that, you are a child of God. And beyond that, help me to live a life that is pleasing to you. Help me to live a life that is full of joy, no matter what the circumstances are. That is my prayer for all of us today, not only here this morning, but those that can hear my voice, those that will see the video, those that will talk to others and that have the encouragement that there is more to life than just problems. God, forgive us for thinking that sometimes. God, encourage us to have a day that is brighter than just today for a hope that is tomorrow again. We give you all the praise and all the glory we lift up to you in the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen.